So today's guest is Dr. Kiara Hudson. She's a postdoctoral researcher at Yale University. Dr. Hudson, thank you for joining us. No problem. I'm excited to be here. All right. So I like to start these off by just asking more generally, what are the research questions that most guide your work? That's a good question. So I have recently reformulated it so that I can have three pillars instead of two, because that's what we're told to do in psychology. But right. so I am, <laughs> I'm interested in the formation, the maintenance, and the intersections of social hierarchies. I have to say that in a, in a snapshot. Okay, sounds like someone is working on her job materials right now. Yes, and also um, my lovely wife gave me soup, so. Um, that looks good, I'm jealous. So you're talking about the maintenance uh, of, of hierarchies and in class today, we're talking a lot about power and hierarchy and we're talking specifically about one construct and its relation to support for hierarchies and that is social dominance orientation. You study with people who have founded this um, construct and who have really um, expanded on it in the decades since. So why is it that you think social dominance orientation is such an important thing for us to understand in relation to hierarchies? So one, I would say that the social dominance orientation, so just as an FYI for people who don't know, um, measures the extent to which people accept and promote group-based inequality. And so the reason why I think SDO is particularly important to study is because A, power is in everything, right? So one, power operates both interpersonally, it operates societally and all the different organizational structures between like those two sort of extremes. And so if you think about it from that perspective, people have different orientations about how they want power structures to work. So in some cases, we're really fine with hierarchy. We're like, yes, there should be some people on the top, there should be some people on the bottom. But the question really comes down to, well, what dictates that structure, right? So for example, meritocracy is technically a way of organizing the world hierarchically. We're just usually a little more okay with that than saying maybe like monarchies, like, you know, there's a divine right here are the people that are on top because God said so, and then everyone else is below them. Both of those are examples of power hierarchies. Um, but when it comes to trying to understand like what are the predictors of who likes one version or another, I think that's where SDO sort of comes into play. Um, and so if you think about how SDO is measured, is usually measured on a seven point scale, asking questions like, um, it's okay that some groups are on the top and others are at the bottom. Technically, then meritocracy is a hierarchy and there are people who like it. And so thinking about, <laughs> you know, we are fine with some groups being on the top as long as like we can justify the reasons why they're on top. I think that's why SDO is such an important construct to study because there will always be inequality in the world. Like that's in some ways like a, a human, um, like it's a ubiquitous statement. And so understanding people's orientations to how steep or how flat that, that triangle is is important for how they engage with the world, how they engage with the um, with groups, how they want to support policies that either entrench that or mitigate it. So like all of those things are really important. And the fact that we can capture a good portion of that variance in a single scale is pretty cool. That's, I mean, that's well put. I mean, you touched on an interesting point there in that the scale itself is pretty vague. It says, how much do you support certain groups being on top of others or something like that? Uh, and those groups could be, you know, most more qualified people or, um, but people don't necessarily seem, a lot of people don't necessarily seem to read into that in the items themselves. So I was talking to you a little bit earlier about when I use SDO, uh, we went over this in class a little bit, most people, the most often response is strongly disagree with everything and related to those sentiments. Uh, and then there's this kind of long right tail, it's right skewed. And so some people, it becomes lower and lower, but cer certainly a significant portion of people are agreeing more and more with this idea, probably because when they read groups and the items, they're thinking of maybe um, groups related to social class or groups related to race and ethnicity. And so why is it that, so um, first of all, do you find similar patterns in your own data that most people strongly disagree with most of the items? Yeah, I think the, my means are usually 2.5. Okay, on a one to seven lucky. scale, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so what do you think it means for the larger construct of SDO that there are uh, a lot of people who disagree very strongly and then you start to get leaking of people who slightly agree and strongly agree? So in some ways, I think that, so I like the scale. I mean, I use it all my research, so I have to say that. I think though that the, the ones 
everyone who is strongly disagreeing actually comprises two different types of people. So the fact that the variance is not necessarily very big, but that little bit of variance that does exist actually can explain a lot, says a lot about, you know, we are probably conditioned to believe in equality. Like we are supposed to like equality. That is how the world is supposed to be. Um, and so that's really all the ones. Now, whether or not they genuinely believe that or just think that they're supposed to say that is a separate question. And that's why I say that all the people who average one actually comprises a whole bunch of other folks. But just being willing to say that they don't disagree as much when certain groups should be on the top and others should be at the bottom, I think is meaningful, given that we're in a society where that is kind of taboo to say. Sorry. I will say though, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. So take this as you will. But uh, the one time we found a normal distribution of SDO scores is when we um, sampled Trump supporters. <laughs> Take that as you, as you will, but it, that means it's not impossible to find normally distributed um, sample. I think what that reflects is a lot of people's motivations not to respond on the scale rather than the scale not being like a meaningful construct in the first place. So just to clarify, you think that the people who are, are straight ones on this thing, they comprise two groups, people who have just been conditioned to uh, reflexively disagree with anything about hierarchy and then the people who more intrinsically actually believe that. Yes. And okay. so if you can devise an implicit SDO scale, you would revolutionize this area. <laughs> because I do think in the same way of like meritocracy, being an example of some groups being on the top and others at the bottom, I think there's a fair group of people who are really okay with that and not okay with it, would want the world to be organized that way. But again, I, I don't know if you've touched on this, but at least in social dominance theory, meritocracy is a hierarchy enhancing ideology. That beliefs in meritocracy is not, it doesn't flatten the curve. You might think it does, but given all the structural barriers that are in place, believing that someone's merit is just based on their own um, you know, actions and behaviors is just not true. Right, so meritocracy is also ignoring a lot of structural factors that could prevent people from achieving those higher levels, exactly. Um, actually, you know, you made an interesting point. We talked a little bit about measurement in this class. So if you had to reverse engineer a study, uh, a measure that would be bad at predicting things, it would probably look a lot like how SDO typically looks like uh, in the samples that I, I use at least. but it can predict so many things like in spite of those measurement properties, which is actually, again, kind of a testament to the, the merit of the construct. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your paper specifically. Uh, in your paper, you found that people who are high in SDO, they show uh, increased counter empathy towards other people experiencing uh, misfortune, I think. It's, they, they're taking some pleasure in that. And this is particularly true when those people come from a, a different racial group. Is that a fair summary of your paper? Yeah, it's also true for empathy, though. It's not just counter empathy, but the counter empathy finding is okay. So, they, so suppressed empathy, and then they show increased counter empathy towards everybody, but especially and towards outgroups when things are competitive. And I think the the competitive part is important, and that is reflected in the last study. Okay, so assuming that there's a competitive context, um, mm -hmm. so one thing I wanted to ask you is. Do you think that what you're seeing among high SDO people is just a lack of an empathy response that they're then either uh, pushing down for, for empathy, or do you think they just don't experience this empathy at all? That's a great question. So I think I might have an answer to that. Um, so my, uh, in my second dissertation paper, I was interested in the question of whether or not this is motivated, right? So is it the case that people with higher levels of SDO um, just can't do this or they can and they just don't want to. And so we kind of tested this in two ways. So in one study, we actually asked people like, hey, here's some negative stories that happen to folks. Um, what do you think the person in the story feels versus how do you feel? And what we found is like SDO is really related to how you yourself feel, but not really related to how you think other people feel. So in that case, it suggests that people with higher levels of SDO uh, can recognize the emotions in others. So that was kind of like a check that we needed to do to see whether or not this is like 
intrinsic. But then what we did in a follow-up study is to actually give people the choice of what they wanted to feel. So if I'm forcing you to feel something, maybe you're just saying like, yeah, I don't feel this emotion. But if I give you the choice, maybe you're like, okay, well, SEO doesn't really track that. And so what we did was give people a series of, well, they were represented in decks, like decks of cards. Mm -hmm. And we said, hey, here's a target. And this target was either someone who's like high status in society, like investment bankers or venture capitalists or low status in society, like homeless people and uh, drug users. And so what we said was, here's a target um, and tell me what you want to feel towards them. Do you want to feel empathy? Do you want to feel counter empathy, specifically schadenfreude? Or do you want to feel nothing? And you can say what you think the target is feeling. Um, and so we it very explicitly defined these terms. We said schadenfreude is what happens when you feel pleasure at another person's pain, like very explicitly. Once they chose a deck, we then gave them a story about this person. So maybe this is Hunter, the drug addict, had bird drop, uh, bird drop poop on his shirt. How do you feel about it? How good do you feel about it? Or how bad do you feel about it? And what we found is SDO does track uh, their choices. So as SDO increases, people are more likely to, to not choose empathy and to purposefully want to choose schadenfreude towards that person. But it was particularly strong for the low status targets compared to the high status targets. So hopefully that kind of answers your question about whether or not they, um, is this just like an ability question? If there might be something to that. So that might be true, but it also seems to be motivated. Um, and I, I would say that part of that motivation is also supported by work by Nora Cataille at Northwestern, where he finds that SEO can actually positively predict empathy, but towards like CEOs of a company rather than towards the janitors. Mm -hmm. So the relationship can even flip, suggesting that it's not about this like ability story. It's, well, what do they want to feel and which emotion are they feeling is in line with their beliefs about hierarchy. Ah, okay. So that's, so it seems like it's more supportive of Sometimes if people high in SEO can't empathize, it's that they want to not empathize. Um, you know, I wonder if you've ever thought about or you think there's potential for using more physiological measures, for example, so to see uh, how people might respond physiologically in a way that might be harder for them to hide in a self-report measure where you could see people high in SEO when they see an, uh, a target who is high status versus low status. Maybe the initial response is similar between the two groups, between a high status and low status tar target but then there's something that happens specifically for the low status target. And that would tell us a little bit more that the response is the same regardless of your status, but then when, it's, when you're low status, then the people who are high in SDR are gonna like damp it down. So, okay, do you think, do you have any plans to do that? Do you think that that's a valuable uh, new direction? Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially for shot and for that people don't like to admit that they are feeling good about someone else's pain. And so um, my, mentor and collaborator, Amina Chakara, she's done some physio studies looking um, at schadenfreude. So what she does is like attach almost like electrodes to see like those micro smiles of like, mm -hmm. um, and so that's one way to sort of get around the self-report. If it wasn't, if we weren't in a pandemic, you know, I would definitely want to do that, that study. We were also looking at um, eye tracking actually of seeing, mm. you know, is it the case that do people hire an SEO actually avoid looking at emotional faces because they don't want to uh, empathize? So, you know, maybe it is the case that they do look at faces the same amount of, of time, but then there just isn't that um, necessary affective response that uh, maybe people lower in SEO feel. So I do think going into the realm of more like automatic processes or more physiological responses is super important. Give me, I guess, three years now to okay. maybe you'll, go you'll into come that back. Room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think a natural follow-up for a lot of people who, who read this work and think about STO is, do you see the same relationship between STO and, I guess, suppression of empathy or increase of counter-empathy? In your paper, I think it was predominantly white participants. Do you expect these same relationships to occur when looking at, at cross-race targets among people from disadvantaged groups? Such a good question. I've tried to tap into this by looking at gender. I've tried to look at race by using Black participants. And the results are messy. And I think that they're messy because there's like two competing forces that happen when you have high levels of SDO in a low status person. So on the one hand, your SDO is supposed to reflect a general tendency towards hierarchy, which shouldn't have anything to do with your own status, like your own position in the hierarchy. 
But of course it does, right? So that's why on average, men tend to have higher levels of SDL, all else being equal than women. That's why, at least in America, white Americans tend to have higher levels of SDL than ethnic minorities. And so your own um, position in the hierarchy kind of does matter for how these processes play out. Not only that, it also matters your level of identification. So, you know, if you are very highly identified with being Black, it's really hard then to have higher levels of SDO. And if you do, it's a mess. And at least in my work, it was a mess of trying to see like what SDO was necessarily doing. Um, I do think that these processes can, um, are important for low status targets, especially if it's about, you know, if feeling counter empathy towards people at the top of the hierarchy also kind of makes sense. We might not be tapping into it uh, in the proper way, at least in the studies that I ran. Uh, but I should also point out that there might be an important difference between the role of hierarchy when hierarchies are, are already formed or they're forming. Um, so at least in my last dissertation, or at least in that last study of that paper, people were randomly assigned to be either an eagle or a rattler. And I would say, I don't have any evidence for this, but this is my speculation, that that is a case of hierarchy formation, not maintenance. And in that case, for the first time, SDA was actually positively related to feeling empathy towards in-group members. And I think what that might mean is when hierarchies are forming, if you really care about hierarchy, you're going to feel emotions in line with what um, that hierarchy sort of needs in order to be formed in the way that you want it to. And so if you think about race relations in America, for the most part, that's stable. And so empathic responses might be more hierarchy maintenance rather than formation, but we're in a space where there's shifting demographics. By, you know, 2060, you know, there might be, uh, well, we're entering into this idea of a majority minority state. And so maybe what might happen is people's ideas of race and around like their empathic responses to members of different racial groups might move from like a hierarchy maintenance perspective to a hierarchy formation and reformation. And so that means that, you know, work on what is happening for low status groups and high status groups is really important if low status groups start to feel like, hey, numbers are on our side now. What does that mean for how this hierarchy could be? Okay, so it seems like, you know, right now it's a, there's these competing forces for among members of disadvantaged groups about what their relation between STO and hierarchy maintenance. But as these demographic shifts happen in the coming decades, that relationship might clarify, frankly. Very yes. Okay, so kind of to jump off of that, looking ahead, um, is there a specific topic or issue in the field of intergroup relations that you're really hoping the field makes a lot of progress on in the next five or 10 years? So, yes. And if anyone who knows me, I'm going to say intersectionality because A, that's what I study. And B, I actually think it's super important because we think we know a lot about stuff but we don't. Yeah, can I, can I ask you just to define intersectionality in case we yes. haven't gotten into in course yet? Yes, so intersectionality is this idea, uh, and it's more like a, I would say intersectionality is a meta theory that has very specific um, hypothesis-driven testable theories underneath it. But intersectionality is this broad idea that our identities, such as race, class, gender, sexual orientation, nationality, all of those things uh, are interconnected to impact the way that we experience the world and the way that we perceive the world. And which is not like a, a, a wild idea, right? But in many ways, if you look at the work that's being done in psychology, there's this assumption that we're only in just one domain. So when we study race, for example, look at how many studies only include men. Then it's like, okay, well, are we actually studying race or only are we only studying black men or, and even in terms of race, we tend to only study the black white dynamic. And so what intersectionality would suggest is like, hey, it challenges the assumptions that we build into our, our research, as well as take things that we probably see as confounds into their own research agenda on their own. So, I mean, you deal with implicit bias, right? If you ask people in the implicit bias world, you get stronger effects when you use male stimuli than you use female stimuli. Why? People just say that's a confound. They're like, that's not necessarily interesting. From an intersectional point of view, that is fascinating because what does that mean about your representations of race and gender if you're getting such different consistent effects? I also can't necessarily find a paper that has that finding in there. That's just something that researchers know. And maybe there's like one paper that actually used that as the focal point. But from an intersectional lens, that is the important 
finding. So I think if we think about what we know about all these big phenomenons from an intersectional lens, we actually don't know enough about it. Because once you start to take intersectionality into consideration, you end up in realms and asking research questions that you might not have thought before. For example, I grew up in a stereotype threat lab. Love stereotype threat, which is the fear of confirming negative stereotypes about your group can make you confirm them. And so, you know, you, everyone says that stereotype threat is played out. It may or may not be real. That's a whole separate question that we can touch down the line. But then I said, well, I'm a black woman. I'm also a queer woman. So do I experience stereotype threat? Like when I'm in a math domain, there are multiple identities that I can bring to bear that would lead me to think maybe I am good at math or maybe I'm not, or maybe these stereotypes don't apply to me. I think there's only maybe one or two papers that really look at stereotype threat intersectionally. Out of all of these stereotype threat papers, there's almost no stereotype threat papers looking at the intersection of sexual orientation and gender, given we all hold like these implicit norms that gay men are like straight women. So do gay men suffer from the same stereotype threats as straight women? Like, is that true? You don't get to those questions unless you are taking multiple identities into consideration. And so if I have to talk to all the like baby psychologists in the world, as well as all the established ones, just think about the assumptions that go into your research. Are you talking about women or are you only talk about white women? Just say that because then we can actually start to see there's a big field on how sexism works with between white people. We have no idea if the same sexism norms operate either intra-racially for non-white targets or cross-racially. And the little bit of research that does exist suggests that it doesn't. So then what does that mean, especially in a world that's getting more and more diverse? So clearly that's my soapbox. I'm gonna get off of it. But I, I think it's really important. I mean, that's well stated and that's a real issue that we're gonna see become more and more central to the topic of intergroup relations, I surely hope. You have to come back in five or 10 years to present those eye tracking studies and tell us how we solved the question about intersectionality. Uh, but I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate no it. Tell us and uh, thank you so much. No problem. Bye.